Scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 17. Acts 20, starting in verse 17. From Miletus he set to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught it publicly from from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit of Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city that chains and tribulations await. But some of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Good to see you all this morning. Very happy to have this opportunity to be before you and present a lesson. I hope you have your Bibles open as we read together in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 24. And thank you very much, Don. It's good to see you up here again. Yeah. Um, we're very uh, mindful of so much of what the Apostle Paul had lived through as there's so much about him written in Scripture. He dominates a good portion of the book of Acts and wrote most of the epistles. And we, by virtue of that, we get to know a lot about this man. In spite of that, it wasn't until we had studied through the book of Acts and the epistles, the harmony of that, that uh, uh, I know my, my initial preparation for that helped me to understand his life even, even more. And uh, I like doing character studies once in a while, and his is very interesting, and there's so much detail given to it. One of the things that we notice about the Apostle Paul is before he was the Apostle Paul, he was very, uh, he was very strong in his, his attitude in favor of God and against anything that would stand in opposition to, to uh, the God that he thought he knew to the degree that he did not mind persecuting people who would follow after a man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He thought he offered God's service in his punishment of such people. Even if he didn't take their life, he gave his hearty approval to their demise, as we read about in Acts chapter 7 at the stoning of Stephen. They, these men laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Here's a man who had a lot of zeal for the Lord, but he didn't. it was not accompanied with knowledge. Later he would write about people just like that in Romans, that his, his people his own brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh, have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. He, would, he ought to know because he used to be one of them. When Jesus appeared to him on the, on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus for the first time and realized that he really is the son of God. And all the efforts that he had put forth to try to destroy those who would call upon his name were all in vain. He had done a lot of harm to God's people, in fact. Imagine at that moment when he thought he was so right, he was so sure he was so right, but in that moment when Jesus appeared to him and he realized not only was he wrong personally, but how much damage he has actually done to the cause of Christ. Well, a lot of that damage turned out to be very good for the church. It turned out to be according to God's will. As we see the first martyr, Stephen, because of what happened to him, the gospel went out into all the world at that point. It fanned out and while they fled Jerusalem, they preached the gospel everywhere they went. And there was no stopping it. <clears throat> when Paul understood, when Saul of Tarsus understood that this is in fact the Christ, he is the long-awaited and prophesied about Messiah. He completely dedicated his life immediately to this, to this man, to this God, to the Son of God. He never even looked back, never wavered. As feverishly as he served God prior to, he was all the more so when he became a child of God through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's quite remarkable for a man who had high status and high position as a Pharisee. He had a future with them, if you will. But he gave all of that up. He even talks about it in Philippians chapter 3, that he counts it as rubbish. He gave it all up. It is all trash to me. 
I would gladly give up all of those things that are temporal anyway. All the glory that could have been mine, I gladly give all that up and I may suffer for the cause of Christ and that I will gain that upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's something that he saw in Jesus and what he saw in the Gospels that moved him so deeply and it set him so concretely that he would never, ever waver from that. For the rest of his life, he dedicated a very, very hard life to the cause of Christ for the sake of gaining as many souls for Christ as possible, even if it required him losing his own. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The title of our lesson is called Immovable. The Apostle Paul was an immovable person. He was movable by the gospel. He was moved from his station prior to, but if you think about it, prior to that, he was immovable. He was not ready to, to accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. When the evidence was in, when he saw with clarity that this is truly the Son of God, you see how dedicated and devout he was to the mission that the Lord had sent him on, the commission he gave him. And there were a lot of things that would discourage anyone. It discouraged the Apostle Paul. In fact, I think about the four soils that Jesus spoke of in the parable of the sower and the soils. You know, the, the hard-packed soil, the wayward soil it's called. It was more or less just compacted dirt. And uh, it, became, it was walked on so much that there, there was nothing supple about it. When the seed was sown, it just laid there on the ground. The birds of the air came and snatched it up. The other three soils were good. It's just that two of them were impeded, if you will. They had problems. One, it was shallow soil. So nothing that would grow there could ever take deep, deep roots. So because of that, during the heat of the day, the sun would scorch the plant. It could not go deep for moisture and it would just die. And there's another ground. You can go as deep as you want, but it's just that it shared that ground with the, with the thorn seeds. And so you had good plants and, and, and the weeds growing together. They did grow, but it was... The nutrients that could have all gone into the good were robbed. It was shared with things that were, that were useless, things that were, were of no value really, and actually depleted any effort to try to, to grow in that soil. And the only soil that was worth sowing anything into was soil that was completely not only good, but it didn't have any of those other problems in it. The Apostle Paul was not like the soil the rocky ground. He wasn't the hard-packed soul exactly. His heart was hardened for a while, but it was for a cause that he thought was right. He wasn't distracted by worldly things, so he wouldn't be like the thorny ground. He wasn't really that soil with the rocks in it. So he's always, he was always the good soil. So how did he get it wrong? No doubt the teaching of his peers and all the traditions that they held shielded him from the truth. But he was immovable before Christ appeared. He wasn't willing to change. But when the right evidence came, then that's when the tra transformation happened. It's no wonder then. The same man, that was how he was built. That was how he was wired. That whenever he latched on to Jesus, that he was going to even be more dedicated to that. But a lot of hard things would come. And among those soils that I just spoke of that Jesus gave that parable about, how many of the things that we're going to look at very briefly this morning did Paul go through that if we even experienced a fraction of that, might we have given up on our faith? Perhaps we would be like the, the, the thorny ground, if you will, the, the, the good soil, but it's got other things in there distracting us. Maybe it is like that rocky ground where we don't have enough spiritual root to ourselves so that whenever the heat comes on that we might, we might fold, if you will. That was not what happened to this man. Things that failed to move Paul, which would easily move so many of us, notice some of the things that he experienced. Stoned at Lystra. Let me just suggest there in Acts 14 in verse 19 that if someone picked up a rock to throw at us, how many of us would abandon our, our faith just on the premise we might get beaten? And even if we're willing to take a beating for the Lord, 
but actually go through that. Could you imagine? What would that be like? I don't want to experience that. I, I would never hope that on any of you. I don't know what that would be like. I've seen a few YouTube videos of stonings in the Middle East, and I don't know if that's the same or similar to the, what you might read about in Scripture, but it's pretty brutal. I would not recommend looking that up. Looks like a really bad way to go. But this is what happened to Paul. Paul and Barnabas, they go into this region here, and this crowd wanted to sacrifice bulls to, to them. They sacrificed livestock to them. They thought that these two men were like these Greek gods that they believed in. And Paul just let them know. They let them know, we are, we, we are human just like you. And they tried to talk to them about the only true and living God. It, we are not gods. We serve the only true and living God. A God who never left himself without a witness, verse 17. He did, he, he did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. But with these sayings, they, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. It's a very odd situation, really. But the Jews who kept following Paul from city to city to try to stir up people against them, these jealous, envious Jews who just would not accept the truth of the gospel, they followed him as far as Antioch and Iconium. And when they came there, they actually persuaded this multitude who was just on the brink. They wanted to sacrifice to these men. And they actually got them stirred up into this mob mentality somehow to actually turn on Paul. And they stoned him. And he dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be, it would be really hard for people to think, you know what, I, I really want to enjoy, you know, to continue. I want to continue doing what I'm doing because it's getting these really, really awesome results of me getting beat up all the time. I don't know that too many people would enjoy that. This would scare a lot of people off. Imagine those, the Christians who came and helped him whenever, you know, everybody's gone. They come and they grab him and they take off with him. You know, the disciples gathered around him, rose up and went into the city. The next day he departed with Barnabas to, to Derb. He's just going to march on. He just keeps going on. How many people might have seen that and like, I, you know, I don't want to end up like that. They might give up on their faith. Paul could have done it, but he didn't. He was immovable. He knew what he was in for. Jesus already warned. I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Well, that's not all. If it was one time, it'd be bad enough. But then, you know, he's, he's whipped. He's in prison. Acts chapter 16. You know, he's, he's preaching along here. In Philippi, and there was this, this slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination. In verse 16. And she brought much... Prophet to her masters, the passage says. And the girl followed Paul around, crying out, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Isn't that interesting? She's following him around like a puppy dog and keeps saying the things. It sounds like the right thing to say, right? That's great. But she did it for many days to the degree that Paul was greatly, notice what it says in my, in my New King James, it says he was annoyed and turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. And her masters, when they saw that their prophet had gone, well, they were very angry. They seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities and brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. So notice how this is building up. There's a lot of false accusation also being laid upon him. There's a lot of accusation here that is supposed to with the intent to, to cause them to be arrested. And it works. The multitude rose up together against them. A multitude. This isn't just a couple people. I know sometimes whenever I walk up to some of you, there's two or three of you sitting there and say, hey, gang. And then I'll joke and say, you know, did you know that two people constitute a gang? You know, well, that's just a joke because a multitude of people is a lot more than just a couple people. There was a, 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 it doesn't say how many, just a great mass of people rose up together against them. At what point here, if you're a Christian and you've already, either you have experienced it or you saw that it happened to your compadre here, that he was stoned and left for dead. Oh, here we go again. The multitude rose up, the magistrates threw off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, he threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. 
this is not turning out to be a good day. Beaten with rods. I don't know what would be worse to be stoned or to be beaten with rods. It's a lot of pain. What would such punishment be intended for? But to discourage anyone from doing likewise. But you will notice that as they were in prison that night, midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening. That's what they were doing. You know what they weren't doing? They weren't in there. Oh, man, it's so hard to be a Christian. You know, I did not sign on for this. Paul says something in another writing in which he talks about the stripes of Jesus. And that he is filling up in his body what was lacking from Jesus. And the implication was not that Jesus didn't do enough. It's just that he basically took the baton. It's like there's this reservoir of suffering that Jesus had, had been in. And Paul's saying that whatever is lacking in that reservoir, I will gladly fill up with my own life. He didn't have a, a death wish. He had a life wish. He had a death wish in one sense. He wanted to go on to be with the Lord, leave this, this life and go on to be with the Lord. But he wasn't looking forward to a painful death. Everywhere he went, he faced these hardships. But he was immovable. It didn't stop him. He just kept going on. And then you get into like Acts chapter 20 that we just read. And here's the thing is that you now have prophecy. You have God telling him ahead of time, by the way, you know, all that suffering you've been, that's been happening to you. You know, that stuff that spontaneously came up and, and you know, you were beaten and thing, bad things happen. I'm going to forth tell you now about what's going to happen. As you go forward, you're going to suffer even more. So what does he say? In our reading that Dominic had read for us in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And he says, and see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. The only thing he knew for sure is that chains and tribulation is what's ahead of him. He has no idea how it's going to transpire, though. He says that. I don't know what's going to happen to me. But I know it's going to happen. to me. And he goes on. He goes on later in this chapter. I don't have it up here as a reference, but later in the chapter, uh, j just or in the next. Uh, uh, yeah, in chapter 21, I'm sorry. He talks about in verses uh, seven through uh, 14. Luke records this this uh, this point when they come to the house of Philip. And while they're there, Agabus, the prophet, comes to them from Judea and he takes. Paul's belt bound his own hands and feet. Verse 11 says, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when they heard these things, both we and those, that Luke is saying, he wrote it, he says, both we, including myself and those, we, ple we pleaded, those from that place, we pleaded with him, do not go to Jerusalem. And this was Paul's answer in verse 13. What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Nobody could discourage him from his task. And nothing could discourage him from his task. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't sadistic. You know? he, he wasn't someone who enjoyed being punished or anything. He was on his way. To a horrible death if he keeps this pace. He even admitted at one point that if, if, if he would cease preaching the cross of Christ, the persecution would cease. He knows exactly what to do to get people to stop beating on him. He knows exactly what to do to get people to stay off of him and stay out of jail. And maybe get to a point where he can just lead kind of a, a quiet life. But that's not the task that he was sent on. They couldn't persuade him. He's immovable. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going. Please don't go. <laughs> You're killing me, guys. Don't you understand? And I think what's necessarily inferred is that my Lord was willing to die for me. And I am willing to die for him. I'm going to go forward. Well, he goes forward. All right. He gets to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21. And he ends up being mobbed at Jerusalem. There are a lot of false reports that were, were uh, mentioned about Paul. He comes to Jerusalem. The brethren received him gladly, but there's also been some reports about Paul, a lot, of, a lot of scuttlebutt, as they say, and a lot of false reports at that. So they tell Paul, here's what we want you to do. 
we have four men that need purified. You go take them to the temple and pay for their for for all of that. You take care of the matter, and that basically will let everybody know that you're not the bad guy everybody says that you are. And in verse 26, he took the man, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So everything's going according to plan. But then verse 27, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. Jews from where? It's like they were... No, everywhere he went, there was the Jews from Asia stirring up people. And they cried out and they said, men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. There's a parenthetical statement, verse 29, the entire verse is in parenthesis. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. We were just talking in a Bible class this morning about judging partially, judging by appearance. They supposed he took him into the temple. All the city was disturbed, and the people ran together. Here the mob begins to form. You're, in the, you're the eye of the storm. They're all surrounding you. They ran together, and they seized Paul, and they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. As they were seeking to kill him. Now look, what did he just say? I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is that bad things are going to await me. The Lord Jesus has, has let me know bad things are going to happen. But I'm going forward. I'm going. They seize him. They abuse him. They try to kill him if it wasn't for Lysias, the commander. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped. What was it? They stopped beating Paul. You know what they weren't doing? They weren't sitting there just uh, having a conversation with Paul. They were beating on him. I don't know how long it went on. That evidently it didn't kill him. As the text suggests, he survived to be able to, to be taken into custody. He's arrested at this point. He even asked if he could talk to the, to the crowd. He convinced Lysias, the commander, that he was a Roman citizen because he was going to be punished by the Romans as well. Because they immediately, that's how they dealt, dealt with things. Oh, you're, you know, there's all this uproar in the city. Uh, everybody's angry with you. So whether you're innocent or guilty, we're just going to beat you. Because we got to make sure that this, you know, Pax Romana stays in place. The Roman peace is a big deal. Some of these officials could lose their life if they didn't keep the peace. And so Paul spoke to them in the Hebrew language. And oddly enough, they gave him audience. They actually listened for a while. And they listened until he came down to this point in verse uh, in chapter 22 and verse 20. And he says, and when the blood of your, your martyr Stephen was shed, speaking as if prayer, prayerfully to God, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, the Lord said to me, O people, depart for I will send you far away from here to the Gentiles. Now, he had him in the palm of their hand, it seems, until he said that. Because they listened to him until this word, Gentiles! Now that was that was a dirty word, you know. The, the Jewish people alone are the people of God, and to the Jews alone are, is the religion of God to be given. That was their view of it. But that was not God's view. God's intention was that all people will be reconciled to God through the cross of Christ as it was intended in the Garden of Eden way before sin entered the world. So Paul said the right thing, and he did the right thing. But then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth! For he is not fit to live. And as they cried out and tore off their clothes, threw dust in the air, da, 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 da. there even come a point when they would say that they would fast until they would kill Paul. They will not eat until the day Paul would die. Which I have a big smile on my face when I read on and read on. And here he was able to escape. He goes to Rome. How long can you go without eating people? But that's not the point. What is the point here? The point I'm getting at is that there were a lot of factors, a lot of factors that would surely shake the rest of us. It would surely shake our faith. It would surely shake the faith of others. There were people in his day, it wasn't like everybody was a superman. Why did Demas forsake him having loved this present world as he wrote to Timothy? At one point, why did John Mark leave the, the ministry? I don't know. Why did so many lose their faith that we read about? 
If it was easy, wouldn't everybody be able to do it? Everybody be doing it, right? Everybody could have done it if it wasn't easy. Choosing the way of Christ might just mean the way of pain. The path to heaven is paved with pain. That's what Jesus taught us as Isaiah 53 prophesied, the suffering servant. And Paul understood that. And though he was stoned, he was beaten, imprisoned, constant under, constantly under the threat of bonds and afflictions, he's mobbed at Jerusalem. He suffered in so many ways that he just tries to summarize it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 23, beginning it says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often from the Jews. Five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things which comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Is there anything that you read in that laundry list of suffering that makes you think, I really want to live like that. I want to experience that just like Paul. Not many takers on that. Why? Why would he put up with all of this? Because he knew that the way to heaven had to be down that road. It was worth it all. He remembered what Jesus actually taught his other apostles, but he, would have, he knows this by revelation. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for greater is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He knows that. He was a persecutor at one point, so now he is being persecuted. He has seen it on both sides of the fence. When he was talking in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and to whom he appeared, and he mentions that he appeared to all the apostles. Remember, 500 brethren once, but he said, and last of all, he appeared to me as one born out of due time. Who am not worthy to be called an apostle is the least of the apostles because why? I persecuted the church. That's the difference between him and every other apostle. This man was immovable. He latched on to the cause of Christ and it meant everything to him. He was willing to go through all of this. And notice, do you think that it was so easy? Do you think he always marched everywhere he went? Big smile on his face. What's he go on to say? Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. This is hard, people. It's hard. But it's the only way. And if my suffering will result in my own eternal life, it is worth it. If my suffering will result even in the eternal life of other people to whom I preach and have influence over, it is worth it. And nothing else really matters. But he's not the only one. I mean, time would fail us if we were to talk about so many. I just have three examples up here of other people who had similar convictions as Paul. I mean, I think of Job who lost everything in Job chapter 1. You know, 42 chapters is a book of suffering, right? But it's also a book of redemption. He loses his livestock, one report right after the other, and his servants, and they were all killed by the sword, and I alone escaped to tell you. And as if that were not hard enough of a blow, and this all happened at once. It wasn't like it happened, and then three weeks later, this other thing happened, and then a year later, this other thing. It all just was in rapid succession. The chapter suggests that just no sooner did the one guy report, here comes another guy running in. We lost all of our oxen. We've lost the sheep. We've lost all the camels. Here comes a guy running in, panting from running, and says, by the way, the house in which your children were in fell and crushed them all. They're all dead. Think you had a bad day? <laughs> and his wife tells him, why do you still hold to your integrity? Curse God and die. A lot of people might have been tempted to do that. But Job had the conviction, very similar to Paul. He says, shall we not accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
That's a very Paul-like thing to say. Or you come back to the New Testament, you know, you got Peter and John, two of the apostles, they're preaching the gospel there in Jerusalem, and they're warned, do not preach in the name of this man anymore. We warned you, do not do this. What does he say in chapter 4? He says, whether it is right, verse 19, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They didn't just ask him, please don't preach in this guy's name anyway. There's always a threat. Remember at this time that many people before whom they stood, they, most of the people before whom they stood in the Sanhedrin were in hearty approval of the death of Jesus Christ not long before. And he's basically saying, at risk of being persecuted physically, at risk of being hurt by you in some way, I am. We are, we are going to do what God wants us to do. We're going to listen to God. We're just going to stay the course. We are not moving from our objective. And even in Acts chapter 5, when all of the apostles were all rounded up, not just Peter and John, all of them together are rounded up. Gamaliel warned them, be careful what they deal with these, how they deal with these people. If they are from God, you're going to find yourself fighting against God. But in spite of that, they go ahead and they beat him anyway. And they went their way rejoicing, having suffered shame for the cause of Christ. They, they shared in that suffering. Why? Same reason that I mentioned a moment ago about Paul. Because those men would have heard the words of Jesus about blessed are you when you're persecuted. And this is the time where that came true. They were not going to move from their, their, their convictions no matter what, no matter what threats came. Or Stephen in Acts chapter 7. I think I'm doing that too fast again. Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He stands before the same Sanhedrin and he gives them a rebuke that, that uh, absolutely singed them. You know, you don't, when you start out with you stiff neck and uncir uncircumcised and heart and ear speech, that's never going to go over well. But it was needful because of the hardness of their hearts. And they were just like their forefathers whose hearts were so hard that they actually killed the prophets who foretold the coming of Jesus, who of whom these people had actually been guilty of killing the man. And unlike the Jews on the day of Pentecost, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? These men heard these things, and they were cut to the heart, but then they gnashed at him with their teeth, and they take him out of the city, and they stoned him to death. And at no point did he give up his faith. He even asked God if it were, if it were possible that, that this sin wouldn't even be charged against them. But he himself was not going to change his convictions to save his own skin. Do you suppose that those men also remember the words of Jesus that whoever seeks to see, save his own life will lose it spiritually? But whoever loses his life for my sake will, will find it. Eternal life is what he's talking about. My word, how many, how many examples from Scripture can you think of? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who will not. They, they're told ahead of time, I'm going to cast you in the burning fiery furnace if you do not do what I tell you to do. Bow down and worship my God, my false God. <laughs> That's what it was, a false God. Bow down before the gold image. And he says that our God will deliver us, and if not, we will not bow down. They were immovable. How many examples in scriptures do you see? But you know, as we think about the Apostle Paul, coming back to the Apostle Paul to round out our lesson this morning, why was it that Paul was not moved? Now, according to our passage of Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, there's a couple of things he says here. First of all, he says, nor do I count my life dear to myself. That's the first thing. I do not count my life dear to myself. I love my life. I, I, I love the fact God gave me life. And, I'm, you know, again, he's not, he doesn't have a death wish. But between the decision for him to live in the flesh or to do God's will and be saved eternally, I really don't value my, my physical life as much. I value my eternal life more. And that was the, one of the reasons he gave why he is immovable. I'm not going to change. 
And it reminds me of Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 and following. For I know that this will turn out for my salvation through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Whether I live or I die, may God be glorified through me. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. I don't know. For I'm hard pressed between the two, having desired to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. The only reason I'd even stick around is because of you. If it's God's will, I will. But when he calls me home, I'll gladly go. And I'm not, I'm not switching lanes. I'm not going on a different route. This is the route I have chosen. This is the path that I've taken. And this is the only path that matters. Didn't Jesus talk about a path that would be difficult, but it's the only path that matters? Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to eternal life, and few there are who find it. And that's in Matthew chapter 7, about verses 13, 14, right in there. He's taken this hard way because it's the only way. Something else he says in Acts 20 and 20, verse 24. So that I may finish my race with joy. That's why he wasn't moved. Imagine putting up with all of this, doing it the right way, but it's the hard way. But then at, near the end of it, you kind of give in. You give up. And there's no joy in it because you've come up short. You've lost out. You're not going to have heaven now. If you've gone that far, go all the way. And that's what he was going to do. In fact, as he talks about it, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about our victory. And he mentions this idea that when the Lord comes, everybody's going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall, we shall all be changed. And he says in verse 54, death then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He really did believe in that. And he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. What's that word there? Immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast, immovable. He's a man who practiced what he preached. And he said that that's basically how he lived his life. And lastly, he knew his eternal reward. He knew what was coming. Just as surely as the Holy Spirit had predicted that he would suffer in various places for the cause of Christ, the Holy Spirit also revealed what was going to happen for those who would be faithful until death. Chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, he starts out by saying, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There is something that we're looking forward to. Something that will last forever in our human bodies, even if we're not beaten to death, even if we're not persecuted unto death, eventually we're going to die. Even if we just have a real easy, soft life and we just die of an old age and natural causes, we have to cast off this tent that we live in, our human bodies. No matter how we go, if we're faithful to the very end, there is, there is a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And nothing and no one can take it from you if you're faithful to the end. You know, the last thing that uh, I want to share with you is what he says to Timothy. It's not the last thing he says to Timothy. But it is a, it, there's some finality. There's a finality to the way he says this regarding his life and his death. In 2 Timothy 4 and verses 6 through 8, he says, Timothy, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. He knows that not by guess, but by revelation. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. It was all worth it, he says. It was all worth it. Every lash, every beating, every imprisonment, every friend lost, 
all of the hardships that he wrote about in Second Corinthians 11, it was all worth it for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord because that was the end result. I get my crown of life and I will suffer no more and I get to be with the Lord forever and ever and that's all that matters. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, let me encourage you to dig deep. Think about yourself. Examine yourselves now. Just exactly where would you be in all of this process if it were you that went through it? This man was determined no matter what. He is not going to change. He's latched onto the Lord and he wasn't going to let anything pry his grip from salvation. And that's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. Be immovable before Almighty God, knowing that your strength comes from Christ every day when those victories, little victories, big victories, whatever, they are all victories because Christ is the one who's winning them through you. We want to encourage you to be mindful of that. Be determined this week to focus on being immovable on your course to heaven. Let nothing distract you from that. And if we can help you at all at this hour, if you have anyone has any desire to become a Christian, Repenting of your sins, being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of those sins. Acts 2, 38, one such passage that makes that clear. We have the ability to do it. We have water and garments. And if you are a Christian who needs to repent or have some need for prayers of this congregation, this is an opportune time for you. Brother Bob's going to lead us in our invitation song. We just ask if you have such a need, please make it known and come forward now as we stand and sing.